characteristics of HMBs. HMBs models, in a nutshell, consist of one or more, are characterized by one or more populations composed of individual agents. We call them agents. They're individual actors, kind of autonomous from each other in some level. That doesn't mean totally independent of one another. It just means they can be dif differently and evolve over time. And they're each associated with some static characteristics, which I'm going to term parameters here. Um, these are often called properties, but I really want to distinguish them from state. And often in math, when we have something that doesn't change, but it's a given, we call it a parameter. Um, something that changes, we call it aspects of state. So parameters, these, these kind of fixed characteristics. And depending on the model, you know, um, uh, some, some you might consider fixed like income or gender, which, which might actually change for other models. Um, but things like you know ethnicity or someone's history of birth weight, someone's birth weight as it was earlier, you know, and it could be you know um, uh, a relational one, a relational attribute like this is my mother, um, and uh, those are things given basically um, for this agent. They're fixed things; they don't change. Some aspects of state; these are evolving aspects of their situation, and then actions that change the state, okay? And, and the very, very term action here is, is also sometimes connoting that often in agent-based modeling, we have a kind of finer grained resolution where you know events happen to people, things happen, there are occurrences in, in a way that we'll call mathematically kind of discrete things happening. It's, it's less of a continuous, um, sort of slow change than sort of, you know, this person graduates or this person um, gets infected or this person recovers from infection. It's this, it's this sort of occurrence that happens. Um, um, that's not hard and fast. You can have continuous change and often for other needs we do, but, but actions is designed, it, you know, has this sense of change and then rules that govern that change. And then some mode, and this is critical, um, quite central to, to the philosophy of agent-based modeling means of interacting with other agents via one or more environment and, 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 and in one or more environments. So these could be spatial environments, geographic, topological, et cetera. So there are these populations of agents which have these characteristics, okay? And then beyond that, there's a time horizon so maybe it's a time horizon of 50 years. Maybe, maybe there's a 20-year burn-in period and a 30-year subsequent um, time horizon for simulation. And there's some initial state of the model, some initial situation in the model. Okay. Um, okay. So um, in the model, we'll say when we build up the model here, we'll often say, okay, there's a population. And then, you know, during simulation, that population will, will include many particular individuals. And um, when we think about the parameters as specified for individuals, we might say each person in the population has a certain ethnicity, a certain sex, and a certain income, for example. Notice that some of these are categorical, um, say ethnicity or sex, or, and some are are uh, are continuous here conceptually, like uh, income, for example. We could also have relational ones, things like you know their mother or 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 their home. Um, uh, and and what this is going to mean is that each person in this population, when the model's running, is going to have a particular ethnicity, a particular sex, and a particular income. That's going to be part of their characteristic. I, I will note that in, in an aggregate model, you know, ag aggregate ordinary differential equation model, some of you may be familiar with that characteristic, uh, that, that idea, you know, you're not going to have continuous attributes like continuous income. You might have income quintiles, right? In, in quintile one, two, three, four, five, um, as stratified layers of your model sort of um, subscripted by that. 
but um, you're not going to have continuous ones. You would need a what's called a partial differential equation for that. Um, but here we have you know this flexibility. We can specify characteristics that are continuous or categorical, or nominal, um, ordinal, uh, relational, um, you know, people's location, uh, et cetera, um, in a way that's uh, quite quite convenient and, and quite natural. Um, you know, we, we can record that sort of data epidemiologically at an individual level survey, for example, right? Um, now, beyond that, though, we don't just have these these folks, you know, with these characteristics that stay there, we, we have aspects of things that change state. And, and you know, these could be, um, these could be components that, um, which is less relevant, but, you know, whether someone's pregnant or not, it could be, you know, change between um, categorical, between categorically defined possible states, for example. Um, and, Typically, when we define these, we, we further specify, and you can see these in the transitions, actions that change them. So, you know, maybe by delivering a baby, someone goes from pregnant to not pregnant, for example, or, or conception um, uh, is when a person goes from the not pregnant state to the pregnant state. Um, and uh, this these are examples of actions. And, you know, here in this particular package, these are from any logic, but we we further have a visual depiction of the rules under which those actions take place or fire or the degree to which they they go off right so we have a here it's not particularly deep thing about asian based modeling but we have multiple types of rules depicted with certain icons and so this might be a a, a rate transition and going a certain hazard rate a chance per unit time associated with pregnancy, what we might call fertility when it's applied to women. And, and, and you know, there's one for, for uh, perhaps after nine months, uh, you know, there's, there's delivery taking place. And, and that rule would, would make sure this action takes place nine months after someone enters the, the pregnant status. So, so these state charts depict at once, you know, possible states, possible rules for changing those states, um, that is letting the agent evolve in terms of their states and, excuse me, actions that change those states and rules that, that govern those actions. So um, uh, we will typically have, agents have states, these changes that can occur in states over time and, and rules that govern when those actions take place and how much they, they take place. Um, one notable feature of agent-based models is we may have multiple dimensions, so to speak, of state. So we might distinguish someone's state as it relates to different concerns or, or spheres of interest, right? So we might have infection on the one hand or care seeking on another. Maybe we'd have their job situation or another, whether they're you know, unemployed, part-time employed or full-time employed, maybe more they're, they're working multiple jobs. The point is that often at an individual level, um, you know, we'll, we'll have these agents that are in certain states with respect to a certain condition and we'll have multiple spheres of concern. Maybe it's whether they're infected by COVID-19, you know, their, their natural history of where they are in their natural history of infection by COVID-19, maybe they're susceptible, maybe they're infected, maybe they're recovered um, uh, for the wild type of COVID-19 and maybe for the alpha variant, you know, and with respect to the beta variant, with respect to gamma and with respect to delta and with respect to, you know, BA1 and BA2 and BA4 and BA5, you know, we have multiple types of um, variants of concern, for example. We might want to characterize their history of infection with respect to all of those. Um, or maybe, we, you know, flu is another one. We want to characterize, you know, their, their, their situation with respect to flu. These are all actually done in very uh, parsimonious ways, very elegant ways within an agent-based model, more so, and, and it, it sidesteps this combinatorial blow-up that we get with aggregate models, where we have to consider all possible combinations. We have 
state variables or stocks, which, which say this person is in the state of susceptible with respect to this, infected, you know, currently infective with respect to that, et cetera, all at once. Here we separate them out. We can parcel them out in an elegant way without, without losing the ability to say there's some interactions. And we'll talk about that, but it turns out this is fairly profound. It has to do with agent-based models, ability to characterize heterogeneity. So we talked earlier in these slides about the ability to characterize heterogeneity with respect to these fixed attributes, these fixed characteristics, these parameters as I'm calling them. Um, you know, we can layer these extra in without blowing up the whole size of our model, without requiring changes across everywhere in a model, like would be required to subscript an entire model by these things for an aggregate model. But so it is with state too. We can kind of layer in aspects of state uh, without blowing it up. Now, for those from aggregate background, modeling background, um, you know, wonderful modeling traditions and something I pursue all the time in conjunction with agent-based modeling and often joined at the hip with agent-based modeling. But there's a difference in perspective and this is really pretty important. And I, I wanna, I want to talk about it um, in our closing minutes here. So with an aggregate model, um, the organization, the structuring of the model is profoundly different from, it's kind of turned on its head from what we see with age-based model. Um, with an aggregate model, we organize the model. We, we divide it up according to state and characteristics. So if we have, for example, people are susceptible, people are exposed, infected, recovered, the way in which we keep track of that information is by putting them in different boxes. And we count the number that are susceptible, count the number that are exposed, count the number infected, count the number recovered. Now, if we needed to keep track of men versus women um, in each of these states, we, we need to have susceptible men, susceptible women exposed men, exposed women, infected men, infected women. We'd, we'd again be keeping track of that information, these differences between people, whether it's in prog progression of infection or differences in characteristics by dividing them up into different boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we organize the model, we subdivide according to state. And each stock counts the number of people in the associate group, right? Um, Agent-based models, it's, it's almost that on its side. It's almost transposed. Um, here with an agent-based model, um, we subdivide the model. We organize it according to the actors, the agents. Um, those are kind of the units of organization. We have all these different agents. Um, and each unit maintains its own state, its attributes. Over here on the left, you know, with SEIR, the organization, each the data that was maintained was the count of people in that. Here, in an agent-based model, each unit person maintains its own state, its own attributes, et cetera. That's a very different organization, um, but between the two types. And you know what was one state in an aggregate model, one state variable, like exposed, is is actually made up of tons and tons of people um, you know, within an, an, an age-based model. This actually isn't, isn't coming out properly. But it turns out we can easily capture nested context as well. I think this is, um, you know, it's also bears noting that, that if we have different levels of organization, so maybe we have cities and we have regions and we have provinces, you know, do, keep a track of that in an aggregate model you can do it. It's just it's all at one level of different state variables, different stocks in, in a in a diagram. Um, you can have stocks for this province, stocks for that province, for this city, for that city, etc. But they're all kind of in a flat high, flat diagram um, and horizontally arranged to each other. In an aggregate, in an agent-based model, you can have them nested in this kind of way, where one lives inside another, lives inside another. Okay, um, and a key component is to allow them to interact. So we don't just have agents as, you know, atomistic 
ev evolving independently, uh, atomistically. No, no, we, we add means of their interaction. And often it's this context that allows them to interact. We could talk about kind of the mechanism side, um, their evolution and so on, but this is about context. And often context is, allows mechanisms of interaction between agents, sometimes directly, sometimes via the environment, like one agent deposits prions in the environment and, and the other one picks up those prions, ingests them and develops chronic wasting disease themselves. So, you know, here we have emergence in, in aggregate models, we have unexpected rich patterns that come out like from a system dynamics model or a compartmental model, we can often see surprising behavior reflecting often non-linearity, feedbacks and, and accumulations, et cetera. In an agent-based model, we do see that. We get, we can aggregate up over the population and have a depiction cross-sectionally in the population over time that count the number of people with certain characteristics. That's all part of agent-based modeling. You're all the time thinking about what does this mean in terms of top level behavior. And often we do think of stocks and flows. We, we think of inflow and outflow for those familiar with it. But agent-based modeling goes well beyond that. It, it, it has emergence among different dimensions too. It has emergence on spatial dimensions over networks where you know, there might be certain areas of a network where STIs live can survive, whereas most areas, the periphery of the network, people with few sexual connections, um, uh, they, the STIs tend to die out. Um, you might have patterns of disparities geographically that are really notable and patterns of, you know, sort of um, uh, syndemics where multiple diseases live, live together in the landscape. These are emergent properties, not just over time, but over space, over networks, and other aspects of context. And this can lead to really interesting phenomena, things like waves, for example, um, of, of infection. Uh, and you can have multiple types of networks. So maybe I have a network, uh, you know, my physician's care network, and then family network, and then collegial network, et cetera. Um, okay, we're gonna be finishing up here. Um, uh, I will say that you know a prominent feature also of these models is the presence of stochastics. Um, when we're depicting things at an individual level, we generally don't have the big patterns that might be described deterministically at an aggregate level. So what we're dealing with is typically agent decision making and and actions and and you know vulnerabilities, uh, whether they're infected or not. It's stochastic. Um, so any one run of the model yields a particular result um, shown up top, maybe a particular number of cases for low SES, low socioeconomic versus high socioeconomic. But if you run the model many times over a so-called ensemble of realizations, you end up getting perhaps a distribution, a distribution of the number of cases in low SES population. That's the orange there to the sort of uh, down here um, versus um, uh, for, the, for the red, for the high SES. And by and large, you see high SES is lower. It turns out both, you can't really see it because the way this is plotted, but both can have zero um, uh, sometimes uh, cases for some of the scenarios. And what you're seeing here is a diversity of outcomes. Some varying in degree, kind of, you know, around this, this peak, for example, in this mode, but sometimes, you know, having very different modes of behavior, like where you have zero infections over the entire time. And if you look over time, what you really get out is a distribution over time and, and outcomes. Um, and you could ask what if questions involving that. Um, uh, finally, we, we have matters of scale and, and sort of different layers of a network. Those who were in the boot camp saw something like this, um, you know, building up a hierarchical model um, uh, where you can have different cities and each city has a population and infection might spread in a city and, and, um, and then spread between cities. And this is very natural. Our hierarchies in the model, in our agent-based models, 
mirror in some sense, mimic those in the world. We have nesting. Um, we have nesting of people and families and families and neighborhoods and neighborhoods and regions or whatever, and cities and cities and regions. And so it is in the model too. It's this natural mirroring. And so we can compare one with the other in ways that are really quite elusive in aggregate modeling. Um, so some notable strengths, you know, region-based modeling. And I provided you on the Canvas site uh, a document um, which, which enumerates us, which I'd like you to read for next time, if I could. It, it kind of goes into each of these in more detail. And it's, I think you'll find it a thoughtful read. Um, so agent models, um, you know, they, they capture continuous and discrete, in fact, relational heterogeneity in static characteristics, as well as in state. And this means we can target interventions, we can examine transfer effects, we can examine um, these effects, which depend on, on um, an individual's, uh, we can examine uh, uh, interventions that depend on person's characteristics, or persons whose be, whose evolution over time is certain certain outcomes, and this is related to longitudinal information. You know, we can we often design our interventions to intervene on people whose histories have a certain characteristic, and we can calibrate against data from individuals over time, their their histories, their biographies, and we can tell stories from the model of using that. But beyond that. We can represent networks, spatial context, multi-level nesting and multi-scale modeling within ABMs in ways that are really quite empowering and quite natural. Um, they're very powerful for comparing against data from the world and, and gathering understanding from stakeholders. We can capture situated perception of agents, the fact that agents don't have a perfect knowledge of the world. They know about the situation around them. They hear about the situation around them. They learn from the situation around them. And they reflect those things often in their decision-making and their risk perception, et cetera. Um, that is a real asset because, you know, sometimes it leads people to make adverse decisions that put themselves at risk, for example. It may limit their sense of choice and options in life. Um, and if we want to create effective interventions, and implementation strategies for implement for interventions, capturing that is important. Um, we can characterize intervention effects um, uh, endogenously in models, capture interventions not as fixed things that are just imposed in a rigid way, but where the intervention itself is playing out over time as part of this complex system. Visualization from agent-based models is really powerful for aiding communication, intuition, gathering knowledge about the system that's otherwise tacit. And we can you know, use agent-based models as kind of these synthetic ground truth sources, which can be really valuable for thinking through study designs and analysis techniques for real-world data. And finally, I'll just note that health equity concerns um, uh, agent-based models and their individual level characterization, linking people up into environments can be really powerful for, for um, uh, helping us think through equity barriers and helping us address them. So I'm not going to go into this slide, but I provided a summary slide and sort of trade-offs with aggregate modeling. But as we'll see in this course, it's tip it, increasingly, it's not a matter of choosing one or the other, but having projects which weave both together alongside each other or, or you know, in the same model, in fact. Okay, so those are all the comments that I'm gonna offer today. I will post these slides. And, um, you know, if there are any questions uh, here, I'm glad to answer them. Otherwise, I will look forward to seeing you on Tuesday um, and hopefully uh, a, a larger group as well. So um, thanks very much. And thanks for your patience with this uh, AV set of issues right now. Take care. Great, great. I'm gonna pull up a chair here. Um,
case anyone has any questions. Oh, I'm glad to, glad to offer it and glad if it offered some some benefit here. Yeah.